Before we can keep talking about some more detailed restoration efforts, I wanted to give our, our last background introduction, which is to our regional area, specifically to some of our coastal salt marshes that um, are of relevance to our restoration uh, thinking and planning and all that good stuff. So we can talk about Magulagoon. Sometimes you guys hear this area referred to as Magulagoon, sometimes Point Magoo. You guys have probably all heard of Ormond Beach, in, partly at least in the city of Oxnard, et cetera. We, we have historically talked about these units as distinct. I would like to talk about them as one large group. And so I refer to them as the Magoo-Ormond complex, this complex of coastal uh, communities. So I wanted to give you guys some background on that today. don't have any fantastic data yet on our hyper-local wetlands, but we do have some great data on sandy beaches. And in fact, we're running a workshop here in January, bringing folks from across the state to talk a bit more about the health of our sandy beaches and how we're going to continue to do better jobs monitoring them. But long story short, um, this is data is old now. This is, this is 10-year-old data. And this data is represented in $2,002. So we've had inflation since then. But, but the point is, um, we, we generate something on the order of $61 billion from our beaches, our sandy beaches in, uh, across the state of California. Um, that's, that comes from taxes, that comes from all kinds of different mechanisms, um, but we spend hardly anything on making sure our beaches are healthy. So, Again, back in, in 2002, this, this data is a little bit, is a bit old, but, but we're updating it now. But suffice it to say, we spent on the order of tens of millions. Primarily, this is in the form of beach nourishment projects. So the point is, huge benefit, little investment. And we see that with wetlands, we see that with grasslands, we see that with so many things. So it's just, it's just nicely illustrated here with sandy beaches. Um, for sandy beaches, for coastal salt marshes, for all these things we're talking about, the stresses are great the stresses are increasing. So in this case, what I'm showing you is the number of folks, uh, overall, the, the top white line there is um, anybody that lives in a watershed that touches the coast. So it might be a county exactly on the coast or it might be a county just a little bit inland from the coast. But um, what we see is going from 1970 to now, there's more and more people, not surprising, our, our population is growing, our global population is growing, so it's going up. But if we talk about, um, uh, what's going on, we see the, um, the coastal population is one being greater, a greater, de greater people, greater density of people uh, than the more inland areas, but also check out the slope of the curve. This curve is going up. The, the beige curve, white curve is going up much greater. This guy is going up much greater than the inland counties, right? So not only do we have more pressures in general on our coastal zone, in these coastal wetlands, et cetera, but that, that relative amount of pressure is also increasing as we go through time. And there's, there's no, so we might have fewer people, we might have fewer people in the U.S., but that's not going to affect our coastal zone. Everybody wants to live and be at uh, where you guys live and, and are. And, yeah, and just quickly, uh, so our current coastal population right now is equal to everybody that existed in the world in the 1950s. So there's all kinds of factoids we could throw up, but, but suffice it to say, lots of pressure. And I'd also say that a lot of people want to come here, even people that don't necessarily live right here. So this is, a lot of you guys have contributed to, our, to this, this, this semester or last semester, whatever this is. This data is a couple years old, but it serves to make the point that um, a lot of people, when we say, where did you last go to an open space or go to see nature, everybody says the coast. And beaches are by far the most popular option. And our coastal salt marshes, which are just adjacent to those beaches, are also popular. So people are coming a long ways to see these things. Um, okay. Not just restoration, anything that we talk about, in general, we take, in ESRM, we take a three-leveled approach or, or three-part approach. First part is, is there a problem, right? Doesn't matter if we're talking about education, doesn't matter if we're talking about pollution, doesn't matter what. First question, is there a problem? And if there is, the next phase is, hey, let's stop the problem. Let's stop it from getting worse, right? So 
the example of uh, is there any is are there any heavy metals in this coastal lagoon in this coastal wetland oh my gosh there is okay check we got to do something first let's look oh my god there's a pipe coming out of a factory dumping it directly in okay first let's go turn that pipe off right so stop that and then uh, thirdly, which is what we primarily talk about in this class, once we've understood there's a problem, once we've, once we've halted the primary source of that problem, uh, the next is how do we recover the functioning? How do we get things going back? And, and that's, again, what we would, would traditionally has fa fallen under the purview of ecological restoration, right? To recover the species, to recover the structure, etc. So we'll talk, we'll start We'll, we'll talk about a lot of this first part, um, is there a problem and what the context is today to, to set us up for our future discussions. So in particular, let's start talking about reference conditions. So how do we know what we're trying to restore to? How do we know if what, what's good, what's, what's bad? And we'll return to this later. Um, so the first, here's some quotes that I have from people that have told me about um, uh, and having discussions about coastal wetlands. So the first one is, it's so sad how things have changed. We need to go back to how things were when I was a kid. That's one thing you hear, right? In other words, that back in time it was great, and we need to go back there, and then it's all good. Very, very persistent comment or sentiment. We saw that last uh, week, right, with our Stanford example, right? Everything was great back then before we put the university in. Was it great? <laughs> right, it was a moonscape before we put the... The, the university in, right? So we, so that's one thing we hear. The other thing we hear from the more technical side of folks is, hey, what should we, what should we return it to? And uh, the answer is we should restore it to pre-disturbance levels. Again, okay, what does that mean? Um, so people, other people are going to say that. You guys as restoration folks or as folks that know something about restoration, that's not acceptable to you. You need, you need to go more. What do you, which pre-disturbance? What, you know, what thing and all this and that. So I normally pass this around, but uh, I did not bring it with me today, but I have, this is a shard. So this is a, a piece of clay pottery um, and uh, terracotta tile, like the tiles on our roof here. So um, would you guys say this is intact? No. Why? Chips are missing. Okay, right, so chips are missing. Anything else? Okay, so, so right, so if you start to look at it, it's actually a piece of, of something that was greater, most likely a pot. This is from about uh, 1,500 years ago. It's in my office if you guys want to see it. This is about, you know, from North Africa. And what's actually being symbolized on, anybody know what, that, what they're trying to show there? Lion. Yeah, a lion, a lion, an African lion. So, so I like this piece because, it, I mean, you know, normally we do a whole exercise and stuff like this around this, but... But the point being that this, um, so this is broken. This is not intact, right? This is part of something that was much larger. Does this have any value? Mm -hmm. Why does it have value? History. History tells us something. Okay, possibly. Anything else? It's still a piece. It's still a piece. It's still a piece. So um, some people would look at this and say, oh, it has no value. The, the pot doesn't hold, or the bowl or whatever it was, doesn't hold liquid anymore, doesn't hold food anymore, doesn't, doesn't have that utilitarian purpose that it, it was created to serve. Other people might look at this and go, this is totally cool, man. Right? I'm an artist. This is telling me how people represented these critters, you know, say, a thousand years ago. Geochemists might look at this and go, oh, I could take a little shard of that off there and, and look at that clay and look at the composition of the material and get, a, get insight as to what, what building material or whatever people were using, um, you, you know, manufacturing material people were using, uh, blah, 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 a thousand years ago and, and, and on and on and on. So even though it's not perfect, it still has value to different folks in different ways. And I would argue that's the same with a lot of our increasingly tweaked, increasingly degraded ecosystems, right? They're not perfect. We've lost a lot of the connectivity. We've lost a lot of the component parts. But there still is beauty there. 
there still is worth, there still is value there for, for many different reasons. So this is my, <laughs> yes, right. So this is my son who's now 13. Doesn't quite look as cute, I think, so I think some people say. Um, so, uh, but this is when he was little, and this is right, uh, this is when I was doing all those Stanford restorations that we talked about before. Um, and so this is up in San Francisco at our old house. And um, this, so the question is, is your house clean? Well, you guys have been to my office. You guys know that I'm not a clean guy. But, but um, my wife is different. My wife is much more like, let's sweep and stuff. I'm like, sweep? What is, what is that word? <laughs> so, so the other thing that we really need to talk about when we talk about thinking of it, is there a problem and, and getting a sense for the system is this notion of shifting baselines, which was first really discussed in the context of fisheries, but has since been come to be applied to a lot of these conservation issues, a lot of these resource management issues. The idea is, or the, or the question in this case is, is this clean? Would, would you guys say that our house looks clean here? And you won't offend me, you won't offend me. Either. What's that? It's based on opinion. It's, it's based on opinion, but is it clean? To you, is it clean? Okay, so it's, so it's not it's not organized, it's disorganized, right? Yeah. So so this this would be considered clean for us back then. Why? Because there wasn't a baby diaper sitting over there. There wasn't a pile of laundry sitting right there, right? Just One year before this picture was taken, or I don't know, maybe like a year and a half before this picture was taken, right? This would be considered dirty in my house. Stuff is on the floor. There's stuff, a, a basket of stuff. In this case, toys. We didn't have toys, but whatever. Well, I have toys, but that's I'm weird. So, so, but it's spilled, right? It's just sitting there. You'd say, "Oh my God, it's messy." You just had a party. You just had a whatever, and so that wouldn't be have been permitted. Without even thinking about it, our baseline shifted, right? This became clean because again, there wasn't dirty laundry around. There, there weren't big piles of diapers over there and all that kind of stuff, right? So this is relatively clean. So our tolerance for what was acceptable changed, right? Just like your, I suspect, I don't know if it's for a fact, I suspect your guys' apartment or wherever you guys are hanging out was probably clean at the start of the year. And now as we're getting towards midterms and whatever, there's probably way more dishes in the sink and this and that, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> So that notion doesn't just apply to your apartment or our old house or whatever. This is a general human phenomenon, it seems now. That, we, that things degrade and then we get used to the degradation. And then that, be, and then for you and I, maybe, maybe, we're, maybe we're old and we're like, oh, I remember when it was different, so this looks messed up. But the new guy coming up, the new lady coming up, she sees that as good. Or she sees that as the, as the default condition. She sees that as the baseline, right? And so what happens is we have this ratchet. What, what, what is very easy to happen, unless we're very explicit about our thinking, we have a ratchet, and it keeps getting worse. What we accept as healthy, well-functioning, intact, whatever, whatever, however you want to phrase it, um, keeps slipping, keeps slipping, keeps slipping, keeps slipping. And without really clear... Uh, mode, you know, um, directed thinking and purposeful thinking, we will allow this to be considered clean. This also starts to get into, when we talk about reference conditions, what's natural, what's desirable, what's, go what's good, all that kind of stuff. So the natural places tend to be easy. Is this place, is this place uh, healthy or whatever? Generally speaking, you, you, most of you guys would say, oh yeah, that, that coral reef looks healthy and that, that uh, redwood forest looks healthy. And our heavily people, peopled areas tend to be considered degraded, right? Like that, that, those agricultural fields in Arizona, this road network up in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, New York City, right? So it's pretty easy to see the extremes, or potentially easier to see the extremes. The challenge comes in the stuff that's in between, which is most of what we have to deal with. So you know, between these two is the, is the challenge. 
So let's start talking about some history here and some of the value of history. History is always valuable. History is not necessarily the guide that we want to follow. But even, but even if we don't want to follow it exactly, oftentimes there are important insights that we can gain from having a deeper historical dive um, with regards to the reference in question. So typically when we start talking about wetlands, we do something like this, which is what you guys have seen before, or at least most of this data you've seen before. And this is uh, lost data, right? So I'm, I'm flagging California in pink here, and then Ventura County in, um, in pink as well, smaller pink, smaller uh, font pink. And, uh, and again, this is relative to about when California became a state, so the 1850s to now. Again, this is only the aerial extent. This is only the two-dimensional extent of what we would now call jurisdictional wetlands. And in fact, in this case, for these for the subcategories, um, this is really coastal, uh, coastal wetland loss primarily we're talking about. And so we here in Ventura County have fared a bit better than, than other places. And we've only lost about half or slightly more than half of our coastal wetlands um, relative to the state overall which has lost 91%. San Francisco Bay Area, again, has lost 95%. So this is what some of that San Francisco Bay Area wetland looks like now. This is the Sonoma Baylands from a, few, a picture I took a few years ago. And um, we're looking, uh, we're, we're on some land and we're looking essentially towards the Pacific, although there's Marin County and some, some mountains in between, but, but basically we're looking westward. So would you guys say this is intact, healthy, well-functioning? What would you guys say? Between, I heard. What else? What? You get, nobody's talking? Who says healthy? Who says healthy? Oh, now I've, I've, rigged, I've rigged the system. No, Who says degraded? Why do you say degraded, Dan? It looks like there's fragmentation, whether there's power lines. It looks like there's development. Okay, good. So we, we see clear evidence of some current human activity, right? Some infrastructure. So that's one signal. What else? It looks, okay, we say manicure, what do you mean specifically? Well, um, going back to the definition of West Clean, mm -hmm. that's way too clean for a wetland, I think. Ooh, it's too interesting. Organized. Too clean, okay. Yeah, huh. it looks very much man-made. Yeah. Well, why do you say it looks yeah. man-made? Because it's very symmetrical. So it's straight. Yeah. So it's straight. Nature abhors a straight line in anything other than a crystal. Right. So if we have, if we have water going in and out, you won't get a straight line, or at least not, not a very long straight line in the case of these channels. So this is actually a highly managed system. So this is an area, these, these are a series of dikes, what we would call. So dam is a, is a structure in a water body to hold water back. A dike is the same thing, but instead of going across the flow, it parallels the flow. So a dike constricts the water within a channel. And that's what, the, and so basically this is, this is a, this is a continue, if we look to the left, we'd see the San Francisco Bay. This is a this is an extension of the San Francisco Bay. It used to be all salt marsh, highly modified. So folks have gone in and dug out those channels, scooped up that sediment, piled it on these areas that you see as land now, or or as, or as intertidal terrestrial area. So yeah, they're highly highly modified. And so a lot of times we look at that and we go, man. You know, World War II, whatever, we humans really screwed this place up. This is density of folks, or, or, or excuse me, these are significant settlements before European contact. So up in the, you know, going up north, and then in the upper right, I'm showing just uh, our area, right? Uh, I, could, we could, I could show a similar slide for Polynesia and all this and that. So clearly we've had a much more dramatic, um, our modern society has a much greater impact, a great, much greater modification of the environment, degradation of the environment than in the past. But to simply go back in time and say, oh, things were so idyllic back then, things were so perfect, I don't know if that's exactly true, right? Humans are part of our ecosystem. Humans are part of our planet and we interact with things in various ways. These folks, say for example, some of the Shubash, were burnt, would burn 
at times, right? Would use fire. Uh, you guys did not. You guys in the park class did not go to Yosemite this year. But if you guys, but if did anybody go on the Yosemite trip last year? Okay, you guys go to Yosemite the park class. Okay, so that whole lower valley of Yosemite, for example, the only reason it looks that way is because Native Americans burnt the hell out of that place, right? So, so um, it's important to talk about human influence not just for the last 50 years or 100 years, even though that might be the most intense modification. We really need to think about what we've been doing over the long term. So for example, these are some images from a museum up in San Francisco, and, um, but the artist wasn't attributed, so I don't have a, I don't have a specific uh, attribution here. But, but suffice it to say, this is San Francisco Bay about 4,000 years ago as, as created from some reconstructions and archeological work. And what you see is these folks are living in and amongst the wetland, coastal salt marsh, using the vegetation for, for transportation, et cetera, using the vegetation for uh, building materials, for roofs and all this and that. And now I'm old enough now that, I, <laughs> that I've seen everybody seems to claim this. It's like one of the things that the anthropologists really love to say. But um, when I was up at Stanford, one of the factoids was the San Francisco Peninsula. So this area here, the, San, the bays, that was the most, um, the, the highest density of people anywhere in North America. So supported, the, so the resources there were so rich, they supported the most number of humans uh, in a concentrated area than anywhere else in North America. And now I find everywhere I go, people seem to throw that factoid out. But, but the fact remains, it was a very productive system. One of the reasons it was so productive were the coastal salt marshes, the complexes around there, and people were actively living in these systems. They didn't just travel from somewhere else to go into the salt marsh, they were in there doing stuff. So that's important to keep in mind. Let's talk about the story of Elkhorn Slough. So Elkhorn Slough, which is a, a project I, was, I worked on before, just before I came down here to help get CSUCI going. Um, so this is in the middle of Monterey Bay. Um, this is essentially halfway between, this is at Moss Landing, this is halfway between Santa Cruz and Monterey, if you guys know the area. It's where the two giant, it's where the giant smokestacks are, power plants are, that you see um, a little bit in that uh, center middle picture. Co that, but if you haven't been there, it's fine. Coastal salt marsh is what it is. And so um, how do we know what's going on? Well, one of the great insights we had was this crazy painter, this crazy journeyman painter that had no money and just wanted to cruise around. So he, in the late 1800s, was, cru was cruising around the US. And he would say, hey dudes, I don't have any money, but I should like to party, I should like to eat and drink. If you guys can give me some food and a place to stay and stuff, I'll paint you a painting. So in this case, the priests at this, at this local um, a, a town just a couple miles inland from Elkhorn Slough said, sure, you can hang out here for you know, a few weeks, a month or so. And so he painted a painting. This painting resides in this church that's up there. So we actually have it. So what, I'm, what you're looking at on the upper left is, is actually a large format painting, right, bigger than the screen here. And um, let's have a look at it. What are we seeing? Well, we're, the, the, pic the picture is painted from the perspective of a bit northward of, Moro ba of, uh, Moro Bay, of Monterey Bay, looking southward. So right here, would be so Monterey, modern Monterey is about here, okay. Um, and, what, and so, what do we so this, this is dated 1890. What do you guys, what, what info can you glean from this map, or can you guys glean the info from this map? So, you, oh, a river, okay, good. So, there's a freshwater source, good. Okay, so there were people there by, by the late 1800s. There's agriculture. There's a lot of agriculture in the in the in the coastal plain. A lot of this is in some type of row crop, some kind of production. Okay, good. What else? A there is a wetland. Yep, we do see we do see marshy kind of stuff, marshy kind of plants around here. Okay, good. Anything else? Say again. Okay, so good. So there's there's a road network, and here's one we see right here, and it comes down here, and then it goes to something. This is before we had bridges or in Louisiana, after we have the hurricane destroy the bridges, um, we go to a barge type of movement system, right? So that if you need to move product, if you need to move horses and whatever, 
you essentially have a, a small boat, a small flat bargy boat. And it gets tied to one side and either people paddle it or sometimes people will have like a, a hand pulley or, you know, on, on, on rope or whatever. But the point is, this is, people are, are this is too, this tells us this channel is too deep to easily cross. Either too deep or too muddy, in this case probably both. So we have this big freshwater source coming in and a problem for people getting across so that we've had to create um, a, a something to traverse it. Anything else you guys can tell? Okay, good. There's, there's all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, we are blessed in Ventura County. We have historical societies. We have a, a kick, kick butt museum in downtown Ventura that has all kinds of stuff from this. So a lot of these images I'll show you in this lecture come from way back when, when I was, you know, 20 years ago when I was going through those archives. There's so much more to be done. Fantastic historical ecology program, uh, 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 project could be done, uh, probably a million of them, go in there and look at this and all kinds of insights. So uh, even stuff that's, that can be more representative art can actually tell us about um, certain, certain aspects about the system. Okay, so the other thing I'll just mention to you guys that's a little hard that, that, that you don't know because you haven't been there yet, but, um, but check it out. Here is the water coming in and there's this lagoon, this lagoon that's going along behind the beaches. So here's the sandy dunes, here's the beach complex. And we have this big lagoonal system, so that's important. This is 1890. Here's, here's uh, this date, 1890. Here is, so see these guys going right here on this little permanent bridge? Here's what that bridge looks like in 1882, right? So just about the time when this, photo, when this painting was painted. And this corroborates a lot of this stuff, right? So this makes us say that, ah, okay, this, was, this is fairly accurate, right? At the level, you know, it's not maybe a photograph, but, but it's pretty similar. And, and there's a lot of traffic going up and down here. There's also additional barges that maybe people are using this river to bring stuff up and down. Here is just a little bit after that. Here's just a few years after uh, this photo and this painting were painted. And what do we see? We see the beginnings of massive transformation of our salt marshes. So what these guys have done is they've come in and they've, they've mowed it super flat. And now they've created these runways, just like that one you might have seen at the Sonoma Baylands. And essentially what this is now is this is the start of diking. So constraining the water so the water doesn't flood up all around here anymore. The water is contained within a, a narrow area. Right? So again, this theme that we talked about before, controlling nature. We don't want the water to do what the water wants to do. We want the water to do what we want it to do. Uh, and then, um, and this actually will be used for salt production. So they'll actually have, allow a little bit of salt water in here, let it evaporate, turn to salt crystals, scrape the salt crystals, and then, and then use that for production. But also, they, now they start diking this for certain things. Now all this other land that was wetland now we can start doing other things with it. And one of the most popular things is to graze it. So to put, say, cattle on there or sheep on there and use that as pasture. Right? Uh, we haven't talked about subsidence. I'll, I'll just touch on it right here um, just so we're all on the same page. Um, subsidence. So what do we know about our, do our wetland soils have a lot of organics in them? A lot of organic material? Yes. Right? The most extreme would be peat, peat bogs that are mostly organic, mostly dead uh, carbon structure, dead, dead leaves, dead branches, stuff like that. So our wetlands don't have that much organic in them, uh, material in them, but we have a lot of organic stuff. Turns out that when we dike these systems, like, like this has recently been diked, so there's a dike over here off the screen you can't see, but, but um, where these cows are standing, the land is sinking. What's happening is all that organic material, which was sort of slowly degrading, right? Because it's, it's anoxic, it's in this, you know, not super fast water moving condition, not a lot of oxygen, this and that. It takes a long time to break down. Well, now we've cut the water off of, from it. So now this stuff is able to dry out, more air spaces, that, that, those, that plant material degrades, breaks down, whoosh, turns into carbon dioxide, whoosh, goes up in the atmosphere. 
And because th this system is nowhere near as productive as our wetlands, we're not, grow we're not adding new organic material at the same rate. We're not adding all these highly productive pickleweed tissues and things like that into it. So we start to get essentially that the bulk of the soil is compressed. And so the, it, the soil is denser, if you will. And what that has the effect of is, sh is lowering the level. So this might be intertidal. This might be exactly at zero, zero, you know, mean, uh, you know, tidal datum. It might be at zero. It might be right at, at um, you know, midpoint of tidal elevation. But then we take this stuff out, it lowers. We've had, so the extreme cases, we have had some places in the San Francisco Bay that have dropped 30 feet. So the soil was at whatever, and now it's minus 30 feet. So from a restoration standpoint, simply removing that dike or simply removing that barrier isn't going to do it, right? Because it it won't it will no longer it won't kick into wetland. It'll kick into subtidal habitat, right? So 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 the the big subsidence gets going in 1915 or or, or is going by 1915. Next picture I'm showing you is a couple decades later, and it says Moss Landing Steam Plant. So that plant is still there. It's changed hands, and it's changed you know some technology, but basically it's still there. Why is the steam? Why is the power plant there? Water. Right. What, what about water? Cooling system. Right. So we take some substance, typically fossil fuel, make it hot, you know, burn it, make it hot. We boil water, and that steam turns a turbine, and that spins, and that makes electricity for us. To keep going, we need to cool that steam down. And so we need some, some cold, some source of cold. Typically we use rivers or oceans. And so estuaries are a perfect fit for those kinds of things because they're fresh water or, or they're water, but yet they're not in the open ocean. So you don't have to protect all of your discharge pipes and all this and that necessarily, right? So historically, that's one of the reasons why people love to put power plants right in or next to wetlands, especially coastal salt marshes. Thank you. So pretty much every single wetland, major wetland complex, you can go from the Tijuana border up to north of San Francisco, and you'll see a major power plant there. Reliant plant here. The planet Orman we'll talk about shortly. Um, uh, Biona wetlands in LA. I mean, it's, 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 that's what happened. And, that, and so Moss Landing is no different. Um, and then we have the addition of the port of Moss Landing, which is going to go right basically where are we? It's going to go right here. This is showing that there's not a, a huge, massive mouth to this freshwater source opening into the ocean. Now we have a huge, massive mouth opening to the ocean. And we actually armor it open. We physically do not allow it to close. Why? We have a bunch of fishing vessels. We have a bunch of research vessels. And people use it as a port. So this area can never close now. And we'll see that. We'll see that. Um, hmm. We'll see that happening uh, in many of our wetlands. So then what we're left with now, now the modern era, we're losing our salt marsh. So now the salt marsh is part of a, a, essentially a marine sanctuary, part of NOAA's National Estuary Research Reserve System. So you know, protected, all this and that. But we're losing some of the channel is disappearing as much as a meter or sometimes more. Uh, the vegetated marsh is, is shrinking by perhaps a meter a year at times. So we're seeing huge erosion, all these challenges. And so as we try to grapple with that, if all we did was go to the picture on 2005 and look at it, it might say, oh, there's a nutrient problem, or there's a this or that, surrounded by farms. And clearly those are real challenges, but, but we've had, we have had this massive history of wholesale altering this landscape. And so again, we probably will never be able to go back to that picture on the upper left, but that gives us some insight. That tells us something about the hydrology of the system, that tells us something about the land use of the system. That tells us a lot of really interesting things. And without this historical knowledge, we would be ignorant of, right? We, would, we wouldn't understand some of those dynamics. So history gives us, gives us useful insights. Okay, 
We're going to switch gears now. Now let's start talking about our local area. So again, what I refer to as the Magoo Orman Complex. And we're going to go through these uh, pictures in more detail, but um, uh, going from 1700s to now. First, let's talk about, um, so we, we, we already were talking about the value of history, but one of the neat things about our site is we have, at least in the last 75 years or so, we have pretty good um, visual records of what was going on in and around the area. So for example, on the left picture, uh, left hand uh, slide is an image from, actually we just got permission yesterday to start flying the base with our drones to do more better high resolution mapping, which is great. Um, but this was before I had drones. So this was, uh, this was up on the peak, right? Magoo Peak, so there's a road that goes up at the Navy controls. And this is um, looking down at the Naval base and uh, looking at the central base, and we're gonna, this presentation, next presentation, we're gonna talk a lot about this area right here, which is um, a former uh, sewage pond site that was one of my restoration projects in the 90s. Um, and so, uh, so we'll talk about that, but when we look across it, it's highly modified, right? We see, maybe you're not sure what that is, but what you can tell is a lot of concrete, lots of lines, streets, all that kind of stuff. It's a naval air station. This picture is essentially the opposite view, taken from an aircraft uh, at essentially the end of World War II. And it's looking the opposite way. So it's, it's, it's from up the coast, looking back towards Magoo Peak. And what do you, and, but what do you see? Can you guys tell me anything about that salt marsh? It looks big, right? It looks large in extent. Okay, good, lots of water, good. A lot of sinuosity, right? You guys can see this. A lot of these tidal creeks, which is what, which is, which is healthy, which is the, the well-functioning condition. They're not a straight line. They're not a ditch. That was put in, that were put in primarily to drain the marsh and to deal with mosquitoes primarily. It's very sinuous, right? There's all kinds of complexity here. All this and that. Uh, anything else you guys can see? Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of human activity. There actually, there actually is by this point, but, but, but relative to now, not as much. Good. First and foremost, there isn't all this stuff that's on the left-hand picture there, right? Mm -hmm. so, so Hayden's point of not as much, there is, there is human activity, but, but not as much, right? So it's relatively restricted. So this is just before we start this major physical modification of this salt marsh. Cool? The other thing I'll just point out is uh, we'll come to later. Um, actually, you do see an artificial channel. Here's one right here. But have a look. Here's, here's where Cayugas is coming in. It doesn't go into the ocean right here. It actually enters the ocean farther down over here, which is kind of hard for you guys to hear. Here's Magoo Rock. Okay. So here is another shot a little bit before that, a color shot, again, of World War II. And so what we, we mentioned just in that last picture that there is some development. You've kind of seen this. There's some pads here. But again, check it out. Here's, the, here's Cayugas coming in. Cayugas doesn't go whoop out to the ocean. It comes here, does some crud around here, and then enters the ocean. And here's the opening, you know, shifted down coast. Lots of sandy beach. The sandy beach grades into dune, which grades into salt marsh, which, grade, which grades into upland. Again, here's, here's, point, or here's Magoo Rock for... For reference. Okay, let's first start talking about Magoo before, 1900, before 1900s. So we know that when we had our first European sailors coming up and down the coast, and from their, jur their journals they kept, that there were large numbers of first peoples, first nation settlements in this whole area. Magoo Lagoon was a really valuable resource. And so there were, there were um, encampments, uh, uh, villages around Magoo. And then since then, we've done excavations. Um, some folks here at CSUCI have done this work, and we've actually done excavations here on campus and found you know, evidence of, of settlement of, of Chumash peoples and their ancestors here. So this was clearly an important area. Round Mountain, if you guys don't know this, Round Mountain, which is on campus, it's a very important uh, spiritual place for... Uh, the Chumash people. 
So that's our, that's our that's on campus. We quote unquote own the land. We don't do anything up there. If we're gonna do something, if we're gonna take an ecology walk or whatever, we ask the tribe's permission and they always say, yeah, it's cool. But the idea is we, we, we seek permission before we go on there. So that's a really sacred spot for sunrise ceremonies. And so presumably Point Magoo also was an important spot and that kind of stuff. Um, so lots of humans here using the productivity, capturing some amount of the productivity that's going on in this center. We get the name Magoo from, from those, those journals of Cabrillo. And, and he was writing down what the local folks, the, the name the local folks seemed to use for this site. Originally, a lot of people translated it as Magu, M-A-G-U, in, into English, but now we, we use the traditional M-U-G-U, or not traditional, we use the, the accepted M-U-G-U, but that came in in 1542. Not a whole lot in terms of European activity happens until we jump, we, we fast forward to the um, uh, mission era, when Bracera and that, that era of colonization coming up from Mexico, Spanish colonization via Mexico. And those folks come up and obviously establish our San Buenaventura mission mm -hmm. in what we would now call downtown Ventura. Mm -hmm. And that launches us into a whole era. Actually, I was taking my son to, have you guys been to the Olivas Adobe? So if you haven't, it's a cool tour. So um, it's, it's very close to the harbor. It's a historical um, park. And I actually took my son there with his class uh, the day campus burned. So I was sitting there, and these guys are telling us all about the, the, the early mission I'm l learning, and I'm like, what's that smell? And I look out, and there's you know, the huge smoke, and also my, my phone starts blowing up with text messages. I'm like, what? People, are you okay? Are you back? I'm like, what? And I'm looking at it, and then the gentleman who was portraying the historic, uh, whatever he was, ranch hand or whatever he was, um, sir, 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 sir? <laughs> yes, there were no cell phones in the late 1700s. Oh, sorry, I'm just, sir, sir, sir. There were no cell phones in the 1700s. I'm like, oh yeah, but I just think, sir, there's no cell phones in the 1700s. So the one thing I do know about that era was there were no cell phones <laughs> during, during that time. Okay, so that really starts a lot of the local hardcore transformation. Initially proximate to the missions, changing the, the native people's behavior by bringing them into the mission. Uh, uh, agriculture becomes big. That's when we get our native grass uh, start, starting to be hammered by introduction of native, uh, non-native species, etc. cetera. Um, and then we start, initially, we'll talk more about agriculture in a sec, but initially mellow agriculture, initially very, very proximate to the mission, but then it soon grows out into the Oxnard Plain. And that is, uh, that's, that's highly fostered Okay, so then by the mid 1800s, that's fostered by the Ranchero period, right? So these so these large land tracts are given out by the governor to different soldiers, different people, and then once those guys have the, that land, then they start to um, do stuff. So if you come with us to Louisiana, you'll hear that that could be passed down to women, which was unique in North America. Most of America, though, it's passed down to the men, because why would you can't trust women to run the land, right? So. So, the, so these, these guys take this up and they, and they start partitioning the Oxnard Plain. So the area in and around Magoo Orman starts to be carved up into private land holdings. Our first good um, a quantitative insight to this area comes with our coastal survey. Again, we're a maritime nation, we're a maritime country. We move our goods, we get our goods through shipping. And so we need to know where the, where the dangerous places are for the ships to go, where the safe harbors are to go, where you know, our, our decent anchorages, all this and that. So we have a major, major, highly accurate, you know, strong emphasis on reality, unlike our current presidential election, um, uh, on, on the facts and the reality. So we have folks that were just spent, spent their careers traveling up and down, very accurately measuring the coastline. They cared about coastline and harbors. So now there wasn't a harbor per se at Magoo or Ormond, but these guys oftentimes would go a little bit inland with their illustrations and their mapping. And then in places like Magoo, which is the perfect place, we have Magoo Peak. So they could easily walk up a mountain and get a better oversight. 
So, so really accurate maps here, even more accurate maps than we might think of, of some other areas. And because they could go up, their inland mapping, which didn't go super far, you know, a mile or two, something like that, but much better than in some areas of the country. So that's a great resource, the oldest one of which was dated 1857. We actually have a website now where all these have been digitized. You can download these so-called T-sheets from the Coast Survey right now on a Google Earth. You can take them in the GIS. So really cool resources we have available to us. Again, you don't always have these resources when we're doing restoration planning. But here in California and here in Ventura County, we are super, super blessed. We're super lucky. We have these great resources, so you can use that if you want. Um, we have the, the, the last big massive drought before now. Um, hits in uh, just a bit after statehood. This is really key. Um, uh, maybe I'll hold off on talking about the grass discussion or talking about this so we talk about uh, grassland invasions. But suffice it to say that that so first assault missions, non-native animals bring in non-native plants, non-native grasses. They want to feed those non-native animals. Disturbance around the mission. So epicenter of invasive plants. This drought is the, is the next part of that that really helps tweak our natives, hurt our natives, and ultimately en en ends up benefiting the invasives and, and ultimately switches the entirety of California's grasslands to an invasive system as opposed to a native system. But that drought happens in, 18, in the, in the mid-1860s. Uh, we build the, por the port, what we, we call the Wainimi Wharf, um, in 1871 to facilitate shipping and uh, and so we start to bring more and more commerce here this is the oldest map that we have of Magoo so this is notes uh, in, a, in a Spanish land grant basically and this is dated 1737 and so this map well it's an ancient map well, is that really helpful well sure do you guys see any, so can you guys tell me, where we're, what, is this map looking north, south? What's this map looking? Good, it's looking south, south slash eastward, right? So here is the ocean, and we're looking backwards, or so not backwards, I should say, we're looking, we're looking down coast. So here are the Santa Monica Mountains, right? Anything else we can tell? There's a lagoon. There's a lagoon, <laughs> check it out. So now, is it, it was actually a teardrop shape, who knows, but... Clearly, it's drawn a great distance from the coast, right? It's pretty far in. If, you, if we go out on, if we drive out to Petrero Road right now, and we turn right, and we drive out to Lewis Road, and we drive across the road, what's that road called? Yeah, yeah, Laguna. That road is named because the lagoon used to go up to there. So think about that. When you're driving home today or, or next time you're on the street, we think of Magoo as several miles down there, right? It extended quite a ways up, right? So again, insights from history, insights into functioning, insights into the diversity of the system and how many species it could have hold, held and stuff like that can be gleaned from these types of maps. Okay, agriculture. Talk about agriculture, and then we'll take a quick break, maybe. History of agriculture on the plain. Um, beginning in the late 1800s, we start adding cultivated crops to mere, to, well, people were cultivating crops before that, but there was small scale. It was vegetable gardens, things like that. What we would consider modern agriculture, row cropping, that kind of stuff, starts in the late 1800s, primarily using legumes, primarily beans. So these fabaceae, these, these, these um, critters of these bean plants, actually can fix their own nitrogen. So that's one of the reasons we like them, or, or farmers tend to like them. Right? So the, even if the soil is not super great, they can, they can make their own fertilizer, in essence. So you don't need to fertilize them, right? So they're a good crop because you don't need to do that. And then the other thing is, what happens in June here on our coast? Yeah, foggy, right? So-called June gloom. So summer, especially the start of summer for us, early morning hours, it's really foggy, right? Cooler. 
So we're trying to get a suntan. You might be a little ticked off at that. Uh, but what it means is for a lot of the summer, a lot of the hottest time of the year, we're a little bit cool. That doesn't go all the way in, right? It goes just to like Thousand Oaks. It goes just to, just to you know, just a few miles inland. But if you're right on the coast, you have in essence a little bit of a refrigerator, a little bit of a, of a cooling down machine. So that's going to mean the evapotranspiration stress, the amount of water that's needed for these plants is less than if we didn't have that phenomenon. So we referred to what was go going on then as dry farming, meaning we put the, put the beans, put the seeds in the ground and then water it initially, but then that's basically it. Don't need a water. It's not like everyday watering or something like that. So these guys didn't need to do massive hydrological manipulations. They don't need a lot of water infrastructure. And they grow what grows more or less naturally uh, with the existing conditions. That lasts up until about the turn of the century. So 1897, these guys figure out a way to take sugar beets and refine them down and turn sugar beets into sugar. And then people go, ooh, ah, let's start growing that here. That, because sugar is going to be a much more profitable crop than beans. Mm -hmm. So we start doing that. But the downside is this, these new crops, they need a lot of water. So that means we need to bring a lot of water to our farm. And then Oxnard is flat. The Oxnard plain is flat. So if we dump a lot of water in a flat pan, we got to get that water off. So then we have to dr dig agricultural ditches, drainage ditches. So we both need to bring that water to our site, take that water from our site. So we're starting to have mass, a huge push for infrastructure, hydrological manipulations. And then of course we have to add fertilizer and we have to add, start adding pesticides and all other stuff. So all that stuff really gets going. The mod, what we might consider modern agriculture really, really gets going in uh, starting about 1900. And we start to see the phase out of all these other crops that are, that are less water intensive, whatever, in favor of these more water intensive crops that are higher value but need much more infrastructure support. And by the early 1800s, excuse me, by the early 1900s, we're starting to see encroachment as now farming becomes really profitable. So now everybody wants to do it. So now all this space starts to become super valuable and everybody's gobbling up and slicing up the Oxnard Plain into different parcels. And we don't really see the, the diversification that we have now in the Oxnard Plain until after World War II. So here is a shot you, you can see, right? So this is from um, uh, about, uh, so this, this is just before we put the base in. So here's where, here's where the military base would be, right? Uh, here's, here's the Oxnard Plain. So even before World War II, look at that. Everything's parceled up into different agricultural parcels, right? And it's encroaching, 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 encroaching upon Magoo Lagoon. Anybody know what this is? A not a town. It's farmland. Uh, it looks like farm, but it's actually not technically farmland. Duck ponds. So for hunters. So waterfowl, especially migrating waterfowl, need a place to rest. Think of, think of a mallard duck, a classic duck, right? Needs to land. They're not like a hummingbird <laughs> takes off, right? They kind of take off and they kind of, then they land like a plane. Like they need some space, right? So they need some open water to land in. So when you want to attract these guys, what you do is you have parcels of open water. And then in this case, these are, little, these are all parceled out so they can control the amount of water in each one. So you can flood some areas and induce grass or rice or whatever you want to grow there. And so you can have a nice food crop for these guys. So these, these migrating birds are super hungry. It's a nice flat place to land, food. So that's, that's a hunting club that's there um, already by that point. But again, I think this is a good illustration of how this, this wave, this front of, of agriculture is coming up, boom, splashing right up against, or about to splash right up against the um, core of the wetland. Um, We'll talk about access and we'll take a pause. Okay, so um, again, 
this theme that we're seeing with all this stuff is starting relatively mellow and then change, 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 and the rate of change starts to pick it up. So that first one was agriculture. Now let's talk about access. How easy is it for people to get to this system? Initially, you just had to walk, right? And we know that wetlands are marshy areas, hard to move around in, difficult to navigate. So inherently, they're hard for people to get to or get through. Uh, we start, we, we complete the first uh, spur of the Coast Railroad Line in 1901 to bring uh, crops essentially towards the port of Wainimi, towards Oxnard. Um, we put in this, this road uh, in the, st start going through some of the wetlands uh, to facilitate people getting to the, the pier and, and a, sh and, and a short-lived um, steam-powered uh, shipping company. 1920s, we opened what originally is called the Roosevelt Highway, the Roosevelt Highway, we now call PCH, okay? So that was, that was really spurred on by the um, um, uh, Works Project Authority, the same entity that, that helped build campus, right? It was a Great Depression thing, get people to work, and so we put people to work. Um, by 1933, that's expanded to three lanes. So this is now making it easier for the large population center of Los Angeles to come up to Ventura County here. It also means you can get crops more easily and, and materials from Ventura down to that big, big urban area. By, but what's happened is the road originally, you can see this next time you drive past Magoo Rock, have a look to the right and you'll see it fenced off. But what you'll see is concrete, oh, it looks like a, a really super, super nice sidewalk. That was the original highway. Um, and it goes around the point. So when we drive, we drive, so if we're driving to LA today, we'll see Magoo Rock on our right-hand side. That used to be contiguous with the rest of the mountain. So up until 1940, up in the late 30s, you had to drive around that, the rock and every, tons of people would die. It's called Dead Man's Curve. <laughs> because um, again, that June gloom, right? Foggy. And that, at points, that road is like a 90 degree turn. So you have to be going slow. And a lot of times people didn't know the area, weren't sure what's going on. And they're drive, 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 foggy, drive, 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 right off the road, right? So, it, so, a lot of, so for recreational stuff, sometimes people wouldn't want to use it because it's dangerous, right? So we blow, they blow the path, they blow a big V in the rock to open up the pass. That, help, that happens in 1940, and now it's way safer. Now it's much easier to come for the weekend to go fish, to go this, go that. So we see a huge boost in, in uh, people coming to the Magoo, Ormond area with that. And then, uh, as we'll talk about next, um, in 1947, Congress, so initially in World War I, excuse me, World War II, we used Magoo as a training area, but it formally becomes a military, a permanent U.S. military establishment um, in 1947. 